Now praise intelligent design. Daddy, don't go down quote mine. I have to add the second line of my rhyming couplet for obvious reasons. If I'm going to praise intelligent design, I'm open to all kinds of misunderstanding, and believe me, it's happened before. <laughs> I want to take back intelligent design. I want to take back other hijacked words. Just as the feminists have rallied around the phrase, take back the night, and just as, less appealingly, the wingnuts have resolved to take back America, maybe we should take back intelligent design in the true sense of the word. Let's take back morality, let's redesign our morality, rather than trying to read what's right and wrong in a 3,000-year-old book. Religion has hijacked morality for centuries. Let's take it back and intelligently design it. Let's intelligently design our lives rather than be dictated to by priests and mullahs. Let's intelligently design our future using the gift of foresight, something that never existed before brains, and for practical purposes that means human brains, evolved. Take back phrases like pro-life. It's been well said by an American that for a religiously based Republican, life begins at conception and ends at birth. <laughs> Let's acknowledge the real pro-lifers, people like Doctors Without Borders, Mercer Sans Frontières. And if you'll forgive a little plug for the generosity of atheists, at the time of the appalling Haiti earthquake, the Richard Dawkins Foundation in America started an organization called Non-Believers Giving Aid, which raised more than half a million dollars within one month from non-believers wishing to contribute. <laughs> Take back spirituality hijacked by religion. When you look up at the stars, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, when you look up at the Milky Way, you have an emotional reaction which some might describe as spiritual, but which has nothing whatever to do with religion or the supernatural and belongs properly to us. Take back spirituality in that sense. More trivially, we might even take back Christmas that winter solstice festival celebrated by ancient British Druids with mistletoe and holly, and later hijacked by Christians. And I'm not one of those who gets all fussed by celebrations of Christmas. I don't mind singing the holly and the ivy and things like that. Religion even hijacks technology, as when tribal peoples visited by missionaries bearing guns and telescopes and all sorts of wonders of science, attribute these wonders not to Western science, but to the religion of the missionaries who brought them. And finally, to come back to my title, take back intelligent design. The only entities in the universe capable of either intelligence or design are highly complex brains or equivalent computational devices. These are not supernatural, they're natural. And they come into existence by explicable processes of which evolution by natural selection is the only one we know about. There may be others. But of course, as I said before, to talk of praising intelligent design is to run a gauntlet of potential quote miners. And I'm just throwing out a warning. I shan't have time to say more about that, I suspect. The ability to design is one of the crowning glories of our species. Bridges, planes, buildings, all sorts of ingenious contraptions. The essence of design in this true sense of the word is deliberate foresight. The designer works on a blueprint, makes calculations of the likely effects of varying parts of the design. Nowadays runs computer simulations, builds models, uses imagination, peers into the future, and asks the all-important what-if questions. 
But living bodies have the astonishing property of mimicking intelligent design. A bird's wing looks designed. When an engineer analyzes the detailed anatomy of a wing or an eye, an ear, a red blood corpuscle, he's bowled over with admiration for how carefully calculated the details seem to be. In David Hume's words, all these various machines and even their most minute parts are adjusted to each other with an accuracy which ravishes into admiration all men who have ever contemplated them. The curious adapting of means to ends throughout all nature resembles exactly, though it much exceeds, the productions of human contrivance, of human design, thought, wisdom, and intelligence. And this illusion of design is what has misled generations of people to think that because it looks designed, it must be designed. It wasn't until the middle of the 19th century that we realized, Hume had already realized uh, logically, but he had nothing to put in its place. It was thanks to Charles Darwin that we realized that there is another way, a genuinely effective way that works, in which apparently designed entities can come into being, evolution by natural selection. And now, of course, we understand that deliberate human design, what we might call true design, is itself a product of that older pseudo-design, which is natural selection. I'll call them paleo-design, the ancient pseudo-design, which is natural selection, and neo-design, the modern, true, deliberate, premeditated design, which did not come into existence until brains had evolved large size. I think it's a del delightful thought that natural selection, having hit on so many pieces of good pseudo-designed devices, the eye, the wing, the ear, the joint, the heart, the sting, the lung, the kidney, the neuron, should finally come up with a new device which actively mimics the process of natural selection itself and finally produce design two, neo-design, the sort of design that makes bridges and planes, computers and cameras, tin openers and adjustable spanners. Intelligence and design come late into the universe for a very principled reason, not just as a matter of observed fact. The reason is that intelligent agencies, intelligent entities like brains and computers, entities capable of designing things, are necessarily complex. They are statistically improbable in a functional direction. Complex, statistically improbable things don't just happen spontaneously by luck. That's what statistically improbable means. And this is the utterly mistaken basis for what is by far the commonest creationist objection to evolution. It's a generalization of Fred Hoyle's Boeing 747 argument. A hurricane blowing through a junkyard will never assemble a Boeing 747. To make a complex functioning entity like an airliner or like a kidney or a hand or a brain, you need a process of gradual improvement. There must be an element of statistical improbability in each one of those evolutionary stages, in each one of those steps by which evolution builds up complex, improbable things like eyes. But the mega improbability of something like a hand or a brain or an eye can only come about through a cascade of micro-improbable steps that occur one after the other, the process of gradual, cumulative natural selection. Neo-design, the design by human engineers, can give better results than paleo-design. There are revealing flaws. Just imagine what the jet engine would look like if human designers had been constrained to change the propeller engine one tiny step at a time, one screw at a time, one nut at a time, one rivet at a time. It might have been possible, though I doubt it, but the jet engine that resulted would have been a pretty strange object. That's the constraint under which evolution by natural selection 
has to work. And that's one reason why very often new devices are not modifications of old devices that do the same thing, but starting from relative scratch. There are revealing flaws in paleo design, revealing flaws in living organisms. Uh, I was privileged a, a year or so ago to assist in the dissection of a giraffe's neck. And my particular interest in this was the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is one of the, it's a branch of one of the cranial nerves, which in all mammals starts with, at the brain, and its end organ is the larynx, the voice box. But it doesn't go straight to its end organ. It goes down into the chest, loops its way around one of the main arteries in the chest, and then goes straight back up again to the uh, voice box, to the larynx. In a giraffe, that's a detour of about 15 feet. <laughs> and I was interested to assist in the dissection, which you see in the picture there, and we actually followed the recurrent laryngeal nerve on its way, whizzing straight past the voice box within an inch of it, and then going down into the chest and back up again. No sane designer would ever <laughs> have produced that. And the same goes, of course, for the uh, well-known example of the uh, retina, the vertebrate retina, being back to front, having its uh, light-sensitive cells pointing away from the source of light with a forest of nerve fibers uh, leading from those light-sensitive cells to the brain, and they have to go over the surface of the retina and then dive through a hole in the retina, which is the blind spot. This is bad design, design one, or paleo design. The human brain is capable of visualizing the future. Human designers can look into the future and see the possible mistakes, see the possible pitfalls, try things out in imagination. Above all, look into the future, which is something natural selection cannot do. This is one of the major misunderstandings of evolution. People are so used to the idea that natural selection produces apparently good design that they think that natural selection must be capable of peering into the future, of taking steps to stop the species going extinct, for example. Never happens. It cannot happen. Sidney Brenner, the great molecular biologist, satirized this by imagining a molecule arising in the Cambrian era, which was no use, but it's, it stuck around in evolution because it might come in handy in the Cretaceous. Nature cannot plan for the future. The human brain can. We can look at trends in the present and extrapolate into the future. We can foresee possible scenarios that might lead to our species going extinct and take steps to avoid it. Natural selection can't do that. We can. We can do the necessary calculations. The problem comes with achieving the necessary political unanimity to put into action the remedies that science tells us by looking into the future. In the more distant future, we might even be able to forestall the extinction that was the fate of the dinosaurs when uh, 65 million years ago, a large meteorite or comet struck the Earth with catastrophic results equal in impact to letting off all the hydrogen bombs in the world simultaneously a hundred times over. We might be able to uh, anticipate such an event and to, to uh, divert or destroy an incoming bolide, uh, not with pre present day technology, but with perhaps the technology sometime during the, this 21st century. So we're going to reclaim intelligent design from the creationist, and I said that we were also going to reclaim morality. The idea of what's right and wrong has been hijacked by religion, and we must take it back. Let's intelligently design our ethics. The idea that we either do or should get our morals from the Bible is a sick joke. The Ten Commandments, for instance, which so many of the wingnuts in America want to hang up in courthouses and other public places. Often those who wish to do so 
don't actually know what the Ten Commandments are, otherwise they might have other ideas. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those are not exactly ethical precepts that we should take seriously today. Um, you may be familiar with the passage in the book of Numbers uh, when a man was caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. There are some of the Ten Commandments which we might wish to adopt uh, today. Thou shalt not kill, for example. And you may remember Christopher Hitchens' sarcastic remark about that, saying roughly, well, I, I, I actually hear it in the voice of John Cleese, saying something like, oh, I see, thou shalt not kill. Oh, how silly of me. We all thought it was a terrific idea to kill. Now we know better. Oh, silly me, and so on. So anybody who's ever read the Old Testament will not want to get their morals from it. And it's not just the Old Testament. The New Testament is in some respects even worse. The odious doctrine of the redemption of sins by Jesus. God, the master physicist who devised the laws of physics, couldn't think of a better way to forgive our sins than to come down to earth as his alter ego, his son, have himself hideously tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. <laughs> Actually, uh, and, and forgive the sin of Adam who never existed, as we now know. <laughs> to be crucified to redeem the sins of somebody who never existed or of all the rest of us for, for the future, whether we actually intend to sin or not. Actually, according to Christian theology, it doesn't really matter whether you personally sin because you're all born in sin. You inherit the sin of Adam, which comes down to you according to St. Augustine, via the semen of your ancestors. What a disgusting doctrine. <laughs> We're all born in sin because of our remote ancestor, Adam, who never existed. And the doctrine of original sin still goes on, even in churches such as the Roman Catholic Church, which since it accepts evolution, presumably also accepts that Adam never existed. The doctrine of original sin still goes on. It's typical of the theological mind that even when it's given up factual belief in something, it manages to carry on with the same, in this case, odious symbolic meaning as though nothing had happened. I can imagine some future uh, science fiction fantasy in which humanity discovers that, uh, that DNA is not actually um, the, the genetic molecule at all. But the theologians of the future might say, oh, well, it doesn't matter that DNA doesn't exist. What is the significance of DNA for us today? The, the coiling around of the double helix symbolizes human love. And it will go on and on <laughs> like, like that. The other way, apart from the Bible, in which you might think we could get our morals from religion, is the divine spy camera in the sky sucking up to God, apple polishing, for fear of going to hell or in, in the hope of going to heaven. Um, I think it was Tertullian, at least it was one of the church fathers who said, um, so, that the, uh, th so that the saved can have pleasure, they are permitted to look at the sufferings of the damned. Not only should we not get our morals from religion, as a matter of fact, we don't. Um, and I'll just um, allude to Dan Dennett's talk this morning when he talked about uh, our, our, my British Foundation's um, survey of the British uh, people and he 
gave, gave some of the results of that. And another of the results of that, of that survey of the people who ticked the Christian box in the 2011 census, in addition to the other questions that Dan Dennett mentioned, we also asked them, why did you tick the Christian box? And we expected them to say something like, because I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior, not a bit of it, because I believe the teachings of Jesus, no. The dominant reason they gave is, because I like to think of myself as a good person. That's a reason for ticking the Christian box. I like to think of myself as a good person. And we then asked them another question, the same people who tick the Christian box. When you are faced with a moral dilemma, do you turn to your religion for guidance? And only 10% said yes. Not 10% of the British people, 10% of the 54% who ticked the Christian box said that when faced with a moral question, they turned to their religion. Uh, the favorite answer to that was, I turned to my innate sense of right and wrong, which is probably what most of us do. So not only should we not get our morals from religion, as a matter of fact, we don't. Um, and I'm now echoing, um, or putting in my own words, something that uh, Peter Singer said this morning, quoting Steven Pinker. The changing moral zeitgeist. Early 21st century people, which we all are, get our morals, give or take, from the time in which we live. We have 21st century morals. Some of us are a bit ahead of the curve, others are a bit behind. There are people who are more liberal, people who are more conservative. But we are labeled with 21st century mo morals, which are quite different from, uh, say, early 20th century morals or 19th century morals. Even people who were right in the vanguard of liberal thought in the 19th century, like Charles Darwin and like uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, his bulldog, they would be regarded as uh, reactionary and actually racist uh, today. Neither Darwin nor Huxley had any doubt that black people were inferior to white people, although both were opposed to slavery. And uh, that's what I mean by saying they were ahead of the curve. Um, they were labeled 19th century moralists. They were 19th century men and they had 19th century morals. My point is that the statistical signal that we get from the century in which you are born is far stronger than the one that you get from the religion that you have or the politics that, that, that you have. 21st century morals are different from 19th century morals, etc. So, we don't get our morals from, from religion. We shouldn't get our morals from, from religion. Uh, I'll now uh, move on. How would we intelligently design our morals? Well, that's what moral philosophers like Peter Singer do. And they make a distinction between absolutist morals, it's just wrong, it's just plain wrong, end of story, and what's sometimes called consequentialist morals, it's wrong because it does some particular harm. Take abortion as an example. If we take an early abortion, an abortion shortly after conception, does the embryo suffer? Obviously not. It has no nervous system. It suffers no more than a plant. A late abortion, does the embryo suffer? Well, after it's got a nervous system, it's at least conceivable that it suffers. But surely nobody is seriously going to say that it suffers more than an adult, non-human non mammal, which has a very well-developed, much larger nervous system. So the only reason for favoring a human embryo over an adult, uh, non-human mammal is that it has this kind of magic aura of being human. There's something sacred, something particular about humans. And that's profoundly unevolutionary, profoundly anti-evolutionary. We are animals the same as any other. We are cousins of all other animals. And if you want to make a case for humans being special in such a way that you treat a human embryo with special consideration that you would not treat an adult non-human mammal, then you would have to say that at some point in human evolution, some kind of divine spark was injected 
into the human? Did it come uh, into Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus africanus, or uh, archaic Homo sapiens? Evolution makes a nonsense of that kind of absolutism. <laughs> The absolutist will say, abortion is murder, end of story. The Catholic will say, personhood begins at conception. The soul is injected at the moment of conception. It is a human being at the moment of conception with a unique immortal soul. There are three identical monozygotic triplets. Which one got the soul? Which triplet? got the personhood. Euthanasia or assisted suicide. Absolutist morality simply asserts that killing humans is wrong. End of story. Intelligently designed morality doesn't say that. It might uh, offer various uh, concessions to the objectors to euthanasia or to assisted suicide. Um, there, may, there might be slippery slope arguments. There might be arguments that say, what if the, uh, the dying person doesn't want to die, but is pushed into it by relatives greedy to inherit wealth? What about slippery slopes? Well, slippery slope ar arguments deserve to be taken seriously, and consequentialist moralists will do that, but they will not lay down the law and say, this is a human life, you cannot take human life, end of story. Intelligently designed morality will look seriously at uh, assisted suicide and evaluate it from the point of view of suffering and benefit. <laughs> There's even rather a good argument to suggest that if euthanasia or assisted suicide were allowed, suicide might actually decrease and the reason for this is not all that paradoxical. There are certainly people who kill themselves because they're afraid that if they leave it too long, they will no longer be capable of killing themselves. And I know of somebody in my own family who did exactly that. She would have been happy to go on living for quite a while longer, but she was afraid, she was terrified that she would pass beyond the point where she would no longer be physically capable of killing herself. And knowing that no doctor would be allowed to assist her, she killed herself before she was actually ready to go. So that's another argument that you might put to absolutist moralists about assisted suicide. More controversially, and perhaps controversially here, might we one day intelligently design ourselves or our children? What about designer babies? Well, for centuries, we've been intelligently designing cabbages. Um, Brussels sprouts and, and kohlrabi and cauliflower and kale, these are all uh, artificially selected modifications of one wild species, Brassica oleracea, the wild cabbage. And similar things have been done with dogs. Who would have thought that a Pekingese is a wolf? Um, but it's a modified wolf, modified by uh, human design, by, if not exactly intelligent design, something approaching it. <laughs> Many people are rather happy with the idea of negative eugenics. Uh, for example, if it's known that there's a terrible genetic disease in a family, uh, like um, uh, haemophilia, say, um, and uh, you, uh, you, you, you will, a genetic counselor will advise a couple who are at risk of passing on haemophilia to a child uh, don't have children. But uh, in the future, and actually getting on for quite soon now, it would be possible by in vitro fertilization, by IVF, to take a very uh, young embryo, just, just post con conception, when it's, say, got about eight cells, and you can remove one cell and examine its DNA. So you, you do the usual IVF procedure of, of harvesting quite a number of eggs, maybe a dozen eggs from a, from a woman, and you examine them all under a microscope, and that's the normal procedure. With the genetic procedure, what you would do would be to take a sample 
one cell from each embryo, and you'd find that in the case of hemophilia, uh, roughly half of them would have the hemophilia gene and the other half wouldn't. And so uh, you would then obviously choose for implanting back into the woman one of the ones that didn't have the lethal gene, the, the, the sublethal gene. Uh, now that is something, it's hard to imagine any reasonable moralist, I think, objecting to that, removing a terrible gene uh, from the population and giving a, a couple the opportunity to have a child when they might not otherwise have, have dared to do so. The, those people who do object to a negative eugenics will say something like, oh, it involves abortion, um, well, um, which, is, which they would say is, is murder. Um, the, the great majority of concepts are aborted anyway. I, I need hardly tell an audience like that, like, like this about that. Positive eugenics is more of a problem. Uh, positive eugenics would be the, the, the choice. You go to a doctor and you say, doctor, I would like to have a brilliant musician for a child or a brilliant mathematician or a brilliant high jumper or a, a fair-haired, blue-eyed Aryan. Um, and a lot of people have problems with that, and I think I do myself, uh, but I, we, I am talking about intelligently, uh, about taking back intelligently design, in intelligent design, and so I think it's at least worth discussing why so many of us do have a revulsion to the idea of positive eugenics. Um, part of the reason is that Hitler did it, or tried to do it, and we naturally are, are repulsed, repelled by anything that Hitler did but perhaps we ought to think a little bit more objectively about what is actually wrong with positive eugenics. Um, the thing about wanting to, say, have a brilliant musician, many people want to have a brilliant musician for a, a, for, as a child, and they don't do it eugenically, but what they do is they force the child to have piano lessons and, and practice three hours a day, whatever it is. Um, so they do it educationally. And uh, people on the whole don't find that so reprehensible as doing it by genetic means, and it's at least worth asking ourselves why we're happy about people designing their children to become great musicians by education and people designing their children to become great musicians by genetics. Uh, there may be good objections to the, to the latter but not the former, but let's at least discuss the question. Hitler imposed positive eugenics by fiat from above. Some moralists will see a distinction between that, which I think almost everybody would see as immoral, and letting the parents do the deciding, which I think some of us would have misgivings about. It's a famous quotation from Jeremy Bentham that I want to move on to now um, when talking about um, animal welfare. Uh, you've probably heard this, Jeremy Bentham, the founder of utilitarian moral philosophy. The day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire those rights which never could have been withheld from them but by the hand of tyranny. A full-grown horse or a dog is beyond comparison a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or a week or even a month old. But suppose the case were otherwise, what would it avail? The question is not, can they reason? nor can they talk, but can they suffer? This is really uh, Peter Singer's subject, but I want to add one argument which I think may be original. From a Darwinian point of view, what is suffering for? Suffering, in the paleo design sense, is a device built into brains to deter animals from repeating an action which has led to a destructive outcome. It's a kind of substitute for death. It's not death, pain is not death, but it's a kind of warning, if you do that again, you might die or you might shorten your life. So that's what pain is for, and there doesn't seem to be much, much doubt about that. Now, given that that's what pain is for, in a Darwinian sense, what kind of animal has most need of the adaptation that we call pain? A clever animal like us or a relatively unintelligent animal, which has just the same need to avoid destruction, and which might therefore need more pain, might need to feel pain more acutely, 
in order to achieve the deterrence effect, which is what pain is for. I'm not saying I'm not putting that forward as a complete knockdown argument, but it's at least worth considering that when we, as it were, rank order other species by their ability, as we guess, we don't know how much they feel pain, we can't tell that, but we, we rank them according to something that we can more or less measure, which is how clever they are. And we kind of make the assumption that if you're clever, you're more capable of, of uh, perceiving pain. And I've just, I just offered you a reason why that might not be true, and maybe even the opposite might be true. <laughs> now, finally, are religions themselves intelligently designed? Scientology is a pretty clear case. Uh, we have the word of its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, that the, the I forget exactly his words, something like the best way to make a fast buck is to found your own religion, and then he did it. Uh, because, as was it uh, Barnum said, there's one born every minute. Um, probably you could say the same thing of Mormonism. Um, we've just heard, I think it was Jeffrey Robertson, um, expounding the idiocies of this religion which well, it looks like one of the two presidential candidates in the United States believes. This candidate believes that a 19th century man called Joseph Smith dug up some golden tablets and read them with the age of a magic stone in a hat <laughs> and translated the message, although he was a 19th century man, translated it into 16th century English. Is, not, is that not the label of a charlatan and a fake? And yet he does have many followers today, including, as we know, uh, one of the probable presidential candidates. It looks as though Joseph Smith was a, a designer of a religion. He may have fooled himself before he fooled others, uh, but so he may not have been quite so designing as L. Ron Hubbard. I think it's also arguable that St. Paul uh, is the designer, was the designer of Christianity. It certainly wasn't Jesus. Um, I, I had a, a, a colleague now, now dead who was a, a great scholar of ancient history in my college at Oxford, and his life's work was to try to decide whether Plato or St. Paul was the greatest shit of all time. The alternative to religions being intelligently designed is, as Dan Dennett, I think, implied this morning, that they might have evolved by something like a Darwinian process. And we can distinguish three kinds of Darwinian process of natural selection of some sort, or quasi-natural selection, that might have been responsible. First, conventional Darwinian selection, which means genetic selection. Could it be that uh, a genetic propensity to be religious actually contributed to our ancestors' individual survival. There's a certain amount of very weak evidence that religious belief confers a survival advantage on people in the modern world. They are less likely to suffer from stress-related diseases uh, and so might possibly prolong their life. Remember that in Darwinian uh, theory, you don't need to prolong life very much in order to have a dramatic effect on evolution. And so something like um, leading a, a relatively stress-free life because you uh, get the consolation of religion might make you less likely to have a duodenal ulcer or something of that sort. Um, the evidence is extremely unconvincing, but it's worth mentioning for completeness. Um, Another way in which religiosity might have a conventional Darwinian survival value is if it's not religion itself that has the survival value, but a psychological predisposition or a set of psychological predispositions which tend to lead to religiosity under appropriate cultural conditions. And I've many times um, uh, suggested that one possibility would be the indoctrinability of children as being a virtue because children need to be taught the dangers of survival in, uh, in, in our wild state, uh, not to 
walk too close to cliff edges and, and things like that, not to go into the jungle where there may be lions and so on. Um, and that the indoctrinability of children, because it's useful for survival, was wide open to parasitic indoctrination by um, parasitic ideas like religious ideas which, uh, which have no survival value in themselves, but which the poor, unfortunate child mind has no way of distinguishing from useful advice. And at this convention two years ago, I added another suggestion, which is what I called vacuum gratitude, the tendency to feel grateful when something good happens, um, which might have psychological benefits and could become grafted onto uh, a religion, a, a tendency to want to thank something and therefore to invent a god to thank. Okay, so much for conventional Darwinian selection. Um, is it group selection? That's just silly. Um, actually, it's not that silly. Um, group selection in general is just silly, uh, but one of the very few places where something like group selection might work, the idea that some groups survive better than others and propagate better than others, Darwin himself, no less, it's the only place in all Darwin's works where he f even flirts with group selection is when talking about, uh, about humans. So it is possible that we could construct some sort of Darwinian model for successful religions surviving better than unsuccessful religions. Um, I would regard that as not really uh, proper natural selection. It's rather more like ecological succession, where one species uh, replaces another as the red squirrel replaced the gray squirrel. For me, the most interesting kind of uh, natural selection that might have favored religion is the selection not of whole religions, nor of genes, but of religious ideas which survive in a population of ideas. It could be that we could make a, a sort of Darwinian case, you could call it meme selection rather than gene selection, whereby ideas like the terror of hell, uh, something like the, 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 the longing for an eternal life might survive in a population of ideas, and we could make a sort of Darwinian model of that. Um, now, I, I just want to uh, discuss the, some of the objections to meme theory. First of all, um, an example of how you might actually go about doing research using Twitter. Uh, in August of last year, there were uh, riots in London and a lot of shops were looted, and in that climate of riot, rumors spread. And there was one rumor that the rioters had released a tiger from the London Zoo, and the tiger was rampaging through London. And some people on The Guardian did a very interesting research project in which they examined using Twitter the spread of the rumor that the tiger was, was, was roaming London streets, and, and also the counter-rumor that finally scotched the original rumor. And I hope you'll see, uh, there we are, the green, the green circles represent the number of Twitters, um, the number of, of, of retweets, rather, of rumors about the tiger um, uh, roaming London, and the red ones are the counter-rumor, or the counter-tweets, that are saying, no, no, it's, it's false, it's not true, it can't be true, and you gradually see the way the red ones um, uh, and and the, the, the yellow ones are people who simply question it. And now the red ones are taking over, and the rumor eventually dies down. At the, at the left, I haven't been reading them out, but at the left there are uh, some of the actual, the most influential tweets. So this is just an illustration of the fact that it is possible using Twitter, using the internet, to examine the epidemiology of a rumor. Um, finally, I, I want to... Um, to answer one of the main criticisms of meme theory, which is that unlike genes, uh, memetic transmission is too inaccurate. Uh, genetic transmission, as you know, DNA is almost perfectly accurate and needs to be in order for natural selection to work. Um, memes aren't like that. When a rumor spreads or when a religious idea spreads, uh, it isn't spread with perfect accuracy. It's only approximate. But I want to to make a counter-argument to that, which is that 
it, it's, not, it's not essential that the exact form of the meme should be transmitted precisely. It is sufficient that it, that if you were to, well, my, my way of, of examining this would be to play Chinese whispers that I think Americans call it telephone, I'm not sure what Australians call it, um, where you have a line of children and you start what we could call a rumor or an idea at one end and it passes down the line to the, to the other end. And usually uh, it, um, it gets distorted on the way. But if it is sufficiently simple, if the message is sufficiently simple, and if it's in the language that the children all understand, it's got a good chance of passing from one end of the line to the other intact. And which would not be, be true if it were in a language they don't understand, like Serbo-Croat. Then it would become distorted because all the children could do would be to uh, repeat the, um, phonetically what they hear, and that's bound to get distorted. My point is that there is a self-normalizing process that each child can recognize that the words that she's hearing are part of the shared lexicon, since they're all, say, English speakers. And therefore, they correct, even if it comes, if, even if an, an English child hears it in a Scottish accent, and the, and the um, English child then passes it on to somebody who passes it on an Australian accent and so on. It doesn't matter if they all share the same language. There's this self-normalizing property. And the operational test would be that if you take a line of 20 memes, 20 generations, and um, in this case it would be tape recordings of the, uh, the, the message, the rhyme, whatever it is, and then you scramble them at random and then you ask people to sort them into order of perfection, of resemblance to the original one, if the message is in Serbo-Croat, and it's English-speaking children, then any observer will quickly be able to sort them into order. They'll get steadily worse as they go down the line. But if it's in English, and these are English-speaking children, then there will be no tendency for messages further down the line to be inferior to messages further up the line because of this self-normalizing property. I've been rushing at the end, obviously, trying to defend the idea of memes, which Dan Dennett and I have both been, uh, been promoting, as, a, as the most promising way in which you might regard religions as intelligently designed. It's a huge privilege for me to be talking to this vast audience, this encouragingly vast audience, it's something that the Australian organizers need to be congratulated for, to produce this largest... <laughs> to achieve this in a, in a relatively remote part of the world, a bigger organization, <laughs> a, a bigger conference, than has ever been achieved. The Reason Rally, I accept, it's a different matter entirely. Um, and I, I do want to warmly thank the organizers for inviting me and for putting on this tremendous show, which I find immensely inspiring for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. We do have time for questions. So in order for as many people to have a chance to ask a question as possible, please keep it a question and keep it short, very short. There's a fine line between a Q&A and a hostage situation. <laughs> so find, locate the blue people. Here we go. Question here. First question. Thank you, Professor. Appreciate it for lecture. Beautiful, strong. Uh, why uh, natural selection? not design uh, brain a human being bigger than universe. Thank you. Big, bigger than what? Universe. Why doesn't natural selection design a human? Design a brain a human being bigger than universe. Bigger than the universe. Um, <laughs> aha. Um, I'll leave that to no, you, no, Richard. Well, I, I, Natural selection is in the business of keeping animals uh, surviving, and uh, the human brain is about as big as it can afford to be, given the birth canal that a baby has to... <laughs> All right, above the exercise, top there. 
Richard, I certainly don't want to defend the Catholic Church, um, having uh, bearing some personal resentment against it, but nevertheless, I would be concerned with the what I think is the inevitable demise of the churches about which social institutions will take up this issue of morality and the definition of virtue. Which, where, <laughs> where is that force going to come from? Well, um, I, 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 I hoped I made it clear that, that wherever else it comes from, we don't actually want it to come from religion. Um, now, I'm not saying that it's, it's easy to know where it's coming from, and I tried to give an idea of how intelligently de designed morality uh, might work, and there are moral philosophers whose life work has for centuries been intelligently designing morality. Um, if, when you say you don't want to defend the Roman Catholic Church, you're saying that you fear that if, that go if, if say, Christianity goes, um, some other kind of religion which would, might be even worse, um, you probably, some of you may know the Hilaire Belloc rhyme that ends up and always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that Islam is far more evil than any brand of Christianity. And so, I, I could imagine uh, somebody making the case that we need Christianity as a bullock against something worse, always keep a hold of nurse. Um, but I don't actually think it's that. I think I'd much rather um, go ahead with um, getting rid of religion altogether as far as we can and try to fight Islam at the same time as we fight Christianity uh, and to intelligently design our lives, our, our morality, our ethics, our politics um, to, 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 so that people can lead genuinely uh, fuller and, and happier lives. Um, the, the, other, the other suggestion that's been made is that if we get rid of religion, um, you'll, it'll be filled with all sorts of woo and nonsense and telepathy and, and um, uh, um, homeopathy and things like that. Um, th th that, is, that is also a risk. And once again, I, I appeal, we all here appeal for critical thinking, rational thinking, which should dispose of those things at the same time as it disposes of religion. Down here. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Now, if you've uh, published this uh, in any of your books, the title of the book that answers my question will suffice. Uh, but what is the uh, survival value of the appreciation of music? This is one of those questions which um, it, it has a, a more general answer. What is the survival value of having a big brain? And big brains. Uh, do seem to have an astonishing capacity for emergent properties, which we also know, by the way, from electronic computers, because electronic computers were designed as extremely fast programmable calculating machines. And before we knew where we were, it, people realized that they were not just calculating machines. Any programmable uh, computational device can also solve crossword puzzles, um, do spreadsheets, do word processing, play chess, um, simulate Vancouver, all sorts of things like this can be done by a machine which was originally designed as a calculating machine. These are emergent properties. It seems that you cannot make a versatile programmable calculating machine without it automatically being capable of doing all those other things. And probably the same is true of brains. When they get sufficiently large, and it was originally natural selection for plain old survival in the wild in Africa, which led to their getting large. It might have been sexual selection. Maybe being clever is sexy or something like that. It might have been sexual selection. Whatever it was, it was, it was Darwinian selection that led to the brain getting big. And then as an emergent property, it turned out that just as computers can do crossword puzzles and logic pr problems and play chess, so human brains can do all sorts of other things like mathematics and philosophy and, and lo logic and, and music. Now, um, Steven Pinker, in one of his books, um, I forget which one, 
uh, does discuss the question of the survival value of a musical appreciation. Once again, it's not directly music itself. It's a psychological predisposition which manifests itself as appreciating music. He calls it the cheesecake theory, supernormal. Um, cheesecake is not good for you, but it exploits uh, innate mechanisms for seeking out food which is good for you, and it's a supernormal, yet there's too much of it, there's, it's too rich. And um, music, according to Pinker, is a supernormal version of sounds which, are, which our brains are tuned to appreciate and analyze, possibly because of speech. In order to appreciate um, language, in order to, 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 to analyze phonemes, vowel sounds and consonant sounds and things, the brain needs to do a complicated Fourier analysis, a complicated analysis of the waveforms in the incoming stream of pressure waves that are hitting the ears. Decompose it into its, one way to put it is into its component sine waves, that's just one way to put it. And it, that the brain needs to do for language purposes and it's very easy to imagine what the survival value of language is. Now given that the brain is doing that analysis, a pure tone, whether by a tuning fork or a trumpet or a clarinet or a violin, would be a kind of cheesecake for the ears. It would be a, not exactly a pure sine wave, but something close to um, a pure sound of the kind which the brain is pre-programmed to analyze for the much more complicated purpose of analyzing speech. So that would be the Pinker theory. It sounds plausible to me, but there may be others. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have left for questions. Please thank Richard Dawkins.